the Wine Foundry is a family-owned uh, family winery focused on crafting custom wines for people across the globe with grapes from some of the most sought after vineyards in Napa and Sonoma. Um, today, my colleague Steve Ryan and I are joined by a number of people who have made Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon from Broken Rock Vineyard. Broken Rock is located just off Silverado Trail, um, kind of on the Eastern benchlands of what would be called Atlas Peak, just north of the town of Napa. Um, before we officially begin, uh, for those of you who make wine, just a couple of quick updates from the winery. First of all, um, the first one I'm going to—I would like to show you a picture of <laughs> the Blanc de Blancs is uh, is happening right now. So if the I, French if I, is amazing. It, it is. We Every have. Time. We have. Uh, let me kind of enter the full screen so you can see it. Um, the gyro palettes are uh are happening and uh whoops well let's well, maybe we'll try this one instead since it's not doing it so here you can see the bottles upside down and the little yeast is just settling down there so the wine Can anybody is, see anything oh no. you can't see it no you were screen oh. sharing black screen oh no well if it was because the the winery lights were off and so if, if you had been able to see it. Uh, so let, let's try this one. Um, is that better? Much yes. better. Yeah. Okay. So it was really nice of Patrick to turn on the winery lights. So it looks, as you can see here, it looks like you have, you have two cages and you can see the bottles basically, uh, it looks like they're completely vertical. They're almost vertical right now. What's happening is those bottles are upside down and the yeast is settling into the neck of the wine. So we're just weeks away from the, uh, from the Blanc de Blancs 2018 to be ready for action. So what, then, just to fill in a little bit there, that process is called riddling. And uh, it used to be done in the old world where you would see, and you can find these in antique shops now and all of that, where they'll have a piece of wood with holes in them and they would have bottles in there and they would slowly come through and give it a quarter turn as it finally would get all of that sediment into the neck of the bottle. So this is kind of uh, step four of making a sparkling wine method champenoise. And then um, this is a little bit more efficient way. And so those cages hold 504 bottles each and we have about nine of them, so, but we only have two Euro pallets. And so um, we're going through that, but um, make it, making our way through it. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll bring the truck back in. It'll go through the disgorgement and dosage process to actually finish the wine. And then we'll be able to uh, get that out. And then, uh, and that's what's kind of going on in the winery. And then uh, Steve, uh, yes. there's also some stuff going, there's a dramatic change going on in the vineyard as well. Uh, and what would the word of the day for the magic, uh, the magic excitement going on in the vineyard be? I'm gonna say either shelter at home or um, Verasion. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it, is, it is definitely, I'm gonna say, I'm going with Verasion. Uh, so Verasion has started. Verasion's a word you're gonna be hearing a lot over the coming weeks. So. This is when the vines kind of undergo a change where the grapes begin to change color, as you can see in the photo here. And it's also a sign that they're starting to accumulate sugar. So once the clusters reach about 50% verasion, um, they'll be, re there's kind of like a, it's kind of like the, a starting gun happens and they'll be ready for harvesting in about 45 to 60 days. So in short, the countdown to harvest has officially begun. Ladies and gentlemen, we're getting close to 2020 harvest, which is just kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, so Steve, are you, are you ready for harvest? <laughs> uh, ask me that in a month and I'll absolutely answer in the affirmative. Um, however, we did get some cool new toys. Um, we had to get a new grape elevator that came in a few weeks ago and then um, Nothing exciting, really, but exciting for, for me. And, uh, and then also a new Anton Parr, new DMA35 for bricks and temp. And uh, it's got like RFID chips we can put all over the tanks and vessels. And it's more of an efficiency play for, for Connor and, and Alma in the lab. But 
so it's it's a geeky thing, but nothing too exciting for for other folks that don't geek out on that. Um, well, thank you for sharing that, and also for our new intern Anton Parr. Uh, no, it is Anton. It, Anton Parr is a is a tool that we use uh, in the winery. Hey, why don't we why don't we kind of shift gears into from what's happening at the winery to That's special place in Napa Valley? Yeah, and, and actually, before we get in there, I want to go ahead and introduce our panelists here. Um, so uh, I'm going to introduce Bruce and Rhonda Prothro, um, who are, that, that's the, Rhonda is the lucky woman on our panel here tonight. So you can pick out whichever cube on your screen has two people in it. That is Bruce and Rhonda. Um, Rhonda is the one with more hair. They are joining us from that's Austin. <laughs> They've got uh, Prothro Family Wines. Uh, we'll hear a bit more about their brand and their experience. And then uh, we've got Sean Hilton, um, who is joining us um, from here in California. And, uh, and, and then below Sean on my screen is Peter Hartman. And uh, he must have gotten out of a mining class recently because he's wearing a nice black turtleneck. And, uh, and, and Pat, uh, Peter is in uh, Soma. He has a brand called Soma Sellers. He's down south of Market in San Francisco in the fog. And taking it out of the fog in the lovely salmon colored shirt is our friend Steve Dury with Stora Sellers. Um, he works with his wife on that brand and she was unable to join us this evening. But hi, Steve and, and Peter and Sean and Bruce and Rhonda, thank you guys for joining us. And uh, cheers to you all. And um, we'll, we're gonna come back on, on that a little bit, but the, the other character um, for this evening's topic is Broken Rock Vineyard. So Broken Rock Vineyard Stu, um, that was the, for those that don't know, Stu hired me in my first wine industry job. I had come out of the brewing industry and Stu hired me as his intern in 2011. And um, after I had to make a bunch of, I had to pour a bunch of cement into buckets, which was great because he'd given me this whole thing in my interview about how the internship was really a hands-on thing, advanced type of strategy and, and marketing and all of that and his first his first assignment for me was to mix some concrete and pour it in buckets to make some posts, um, which was awesome. I I did most of them well and uh, and shortly after that he took me to uh, the first vineyard I'd been to uh, while working in the wine industry, which was Broken Rock, and uh, and so it's kind of got a special place in my in my heart. Uh, Stu, I don't know if you remember that or not, but. I do. Well, it's also, you know, it's also kind of one of those double-edged swords because when your intern goes from being your intern to your boss in six months, um, it's, it's just, you know, uh, Steve was just like riding on a, a bicycle on a trajectory like this. It was like, oh, he understands something called business. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and I, and I did not have the B word in my vocabulary. So he, he quickly wrote. So Steve, of course I remember. And it was also right by where we were you know, kind of where, where we were stationed in the valley and um, where, I mean, wh what direction do you want to go with this? Uh, with, with Let's say, start, start in the background real quick. Um, so Broken Rock is owned by a gentleman named Bill Hill um, and Bill Hill, also known as William Hill. Um, Bill moved uh, from Oklahoma to Napa back in the mid seventies, I think 75, 74. 74, 75, exactly. Yeah, and, uh, and then he, he did his first release under the William Hill brand in 1978. Um, and Broken Rock is actually his home vineyard. Um, and so you can see on Sue's map kind of where it is. If you can zoom in, maybe we can get a, a little better look. But, um, and one of the great things about visiting Broken Rock Vineyard are that at that Soda Canyon store right there, just south right there, um, that is, uh, they've got great sandwiches um, there. So. Um, but uh, Bill is kind of a Napa legend. Um, for those that are that are unfamiliar, he um, really was on the forefront of everything that was really exciting and happening and bringing Napa Valley into the world market. So you know you, you hear about the um, Judgment of Paris and all of that, but um, Bill Bill was right there with all of those people. He also took a very um, proactive stance in changing a lot of farming techniques in Napa. Is that fair, Stu? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you're going to hear, if you kind of are into viticulture, into grape growing, you're going to hear about like high density plantings where basically 
you put like where they used to have the row, the, the, the grape rows very far apart, eight feet, uh, six to eight feet to allow tractors to go through. Um, you know, Bill was one of the first people who kind of started what we called interplanting, where he put vines right between the other vines and then really tighten up that density of planting. And why? So that the grapes have to, the vines have to compete against one another. And the struggle is real. Um, the berries are gonna be smaller, more concentrated as they seek, um, as they seek nutrients. He also was playing, playing around with rootstock and clonal combinations, um, very meticulous farm. He's still at it. You know, Steve, I was kind of telling you I was out in the vineyard last harvest and he was kind of showing off a new leaf pulling technique. Um, he's, he's kind of like a little magic elf, really excited out in the, uh, in the vineyards, kind of showing off, like he's, you know, he's still trying new things, you know, trying to play with new ideas. Yeah, so Bro Broken Rock's a, 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 in total, at, it's 44 acres is the field. It's, it ranges between 600 and 800 feet. Um, it is a Napa Valley AVA designate. It cannot be, a, Stu, you definitely know this, it cannot be an Atlas Peak designation because in order to be included in the Atlas Peak AVA, you have to be 760 feet in elevation. And there's only a small segment of the vineyard that can do that, some certain rows, actually, not even a whole block. The fruit's been used by Philippe Melka, Chapelet, Paul Hobbs, Hall, um, the wine foundry for since 2012. We've had it every year, um, and uh, and a lot of the brands that that we work with. And um, his daughter is also kind of being groomed into uh, taking over the vineyard. She's got a very active role as well. Yeah, you see Alana out there. Um, all of the hey time. Hey Steve, is it too early? To, I have before we kind of jump in. Is it okay? If, we have a, a question on uh, via text, um, yeah. and you can so and you can use the Q and A function um, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it says Q and A, and you can ask your questions that way. Um, but this one uh, comes in uh, from Chris, who is going to be asking us. So, what makes Atlas Peak uh, the Atlas Peak Benchlands or Atlas Shoulder unique? Um, or actually, I'm wondering, do we, at, should we, should we kind of table that and kind of see how the, everyone on the panel is kind of answering yeah. that? Yeah, I think so. So I think we're all going to have our own take on that. And I think uh, let's, let's bring our panelists into, in the, into the fold okay. here. Um, okay. So, Hey, so again, uh, introducing Rhonda and Bruce, Steve Dury, Rhonda and Bruce of Prothro Family Sellers, Steve Dury of Stora Sellers. Uh, Sean Hilton, who's going to be, makes his wine in a different way because he doesn't have a commercial brand. You mean he Sean? Wine. Sean, Sean, sorry about that. Makes his wine for fun. And Peter Hartman uh, has his, uh, his Soma Cellars brand. Why don't we start off with Merlot? Um, yep. Bruce, Thank you, Bruce and Rhonda. Bruce and Rhonda, you guys have been making Merlot for, for a number of vintages. Um, What's the deal with Merlot from Broken Rock? Well, I, I think let's look at Broken Rock in general. You typically, from, from, from our perspective, you get deeper fruit, a darker fruit, uh, and you get this underlying complexity that goes from tobacco leaf to leather to graphite um, uh, to, you know, some, some, some herbaceousness within the wine that, that's really quite pleasant. Um, there's great depth, there's great body, there's great mouthfeel coming out of Broken Rock. Um, we, we do our Merlot in, in what we call our cuvee. So right now we're at cuvee number four, it's a red wine. We purposely don't call it Merlot. When we started the, the cuvee project, uh, we actually started with a blend of, of, of five different vineyards from, from Napa on the cab side. Um, and, and, and that was really quite nice. But then we had that cab, we had our, our Broken Rock cab, and then we had our Georgia's, uh, you know, our G3 cab. Um, and so we wanted to differentiate that a little bit. And so we, we stumbled upon um, the Merlot. And um, we like Broken Rock because... Um, 
it gives us body, it gives us depth. Um, it gives us a little bit of anger and broodiness to it. Um, like that, that. That, that, yeah, that. So, and so what, what, the broodiness, the furrowed brow, so what do you mean by that? Um, Broken Rock, in, 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 from our point of view, it, it's a little petulant. Uh, it's not a wine that's going to exhibit all of its qualities upon release. Uh, from the Merlot to the Cab, it needs time. It, it, it really starts to unfold in two to three to four years. And then it, and then it becomes this wonderful, wonderful wine. It's great, you know, uh, upon bottling and upon initial release, it is accessible. And that's what you get from the combination of being, you know, in the bench lens, stag's leap, you know, on the shoulder of one side and, and close to the valley floor. But, but it also kind of gives you this, this, this reluctance to fully open up and be accessible. It holds something back. Um, we talk about our cab from Broken Rock as being, well, we talk about our cabs as, as James Bond characters. Uh, so, you know, our G3 is Sean Connery, of course, you know, nice and elegant and everything else. Um, we talk about our, our cuvee, which is our Merlot from Broken Rock, as being Roger Moore. Uh, we talk about our Broken Rock cab as being Daniel Craig. And, you know, Rhonda says it's Daniel Craig coming, you know, out of the ocean onto the beach. I <laughs> Daniel Craig in a tuxedo. Um, <laughs> but 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 Ron is right. There's always a little blood on Daniel Craig. He's very intense, but when he smiles, he opens up. He's and earned. He's earned those road that's, miles. That that's Broken Rock. Um, dark fruit, complexity, layers of flavor, graphite, and then the Merlot itself. Whenever we do barrel samples of the Merlot or start to blend the Merlot, Rhonda says. I'm from, Te I live in Texas and I like my steak. And so when I smell Merlot, I want a steak. And I know that's when we've, on we're onto something. Right. And so, and so with Broken Rock, we get that. Mm -hmm. um, if we could wipe the slate clean and go back and say, okay, create the perfect steakhouse wine, I think the Merlot from Broken Rock becomes the perfect steakhouse wine because it has body, but it also has accessibility and also has a nice roundness with edge, as opposed to being like a Valley Floor Merlot that's just round and plush. Um, for me, what, what Broken Rock gives us that I'm always, always attracted to, there's this underlying brine cured olive, green oliveness to it. Hmm. Um, kind of like the old Rutherford Hill Merlots from the 80s and early 90s. Um, and I like that character of it. And I like that quality. And I think that just adds a really, really nice complexity. I'm tasting the 2008, very well put. I'm tasting the 2018 barrel samples. So uh, yeah, kind of, kind of pulled out a barrel. And uh, absolutely, there's a lot of layers going on. And I liked how you pointed out, it's not just about fruit, right? So you keep on coming back to it. So there's herbaceous notes, there's this olive character, there's a lot going on. It's not a one trick pony. And yeah. look, Go ahead. Uh, Steve, I was just going to say, you know, Bruce kind of set us up there by saying it's not just a Valley floor Merlot. What, you know, the grape was unfairly maligned. Dr. Ryan, whoa, help us but, out. Yeah. So, I mean, Merlot was overplanted, overcropped and, um, and overutilized. Um, and it just, you know, we can, we, we won't, we'll spare everybody it, but you, you know, there is the whole sideways thing. I will not drink any bleep and Merlot, all of that. And then Merlot sales dropped, Pinot became all the rage, blah, blah, blah. But, um, but really it was about people not treating the grape with respect, but Merlot is probably, it, it's probably my second favorite grape. I was going to say third, but I think mine go Cabernet Franc, Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and, but this Merlot in particular, what I love about it, and we say this in the cellar, is that it, Broken Rock Merlot, is a, it's a Merlot masquerading as a cab because it's got some structure. It's got a little bit of length to the finish, even as a 100% barrel sample like Stu's having right there. Um, and it's, and, and I, to, to Bruce's point, and this maybe goes and answers the question you got on, on your phone earlier, Stu, is that um, we've got 
what I think is special about this property is that it's the perfect combination of mountain fruit and valley floor. You get the opulence and the lushness from the valley floor, and you get the um, you get the you get a little bit of structure as though you're up higher on the mountain and on a slope. And I I've, and and that's Benchland that's Benchland at its finest, in my opinion. That's really what it's, what it's about. But I think the Merlot exhibits that more so than anything else um, out of that site. So, so Steve, you you mentioned you know the much maligned Merlot from the uh, early two thousands. You know, I remember you know my dad who 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 couldn't tell you very much about wine was just conditioned to walk into a restaurant and say, "I'll take a glass of your Merlot." Yeah. You no, know, it was it was just that pervasive, and 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 as sideways happen and as Merlot sales drop. You know, people are smart. They want to convert their 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 vineyard to something that's going to return a, a profit and make money for them. So they ripped out the Merlot. And those special places um, uh, where Merlot did really, really well continue to flourish. And to us, Broken Rock is one of those special places. It gives you a Merlot of depth and character and structure, um, masquerading as a cab but also having you know, the, the qualities that we would expect from our, uh, our Merlot. Um, we purposely call ours Cuvée. We didn't want to call it Merlot because we were kind of afraid of the sideways blowback. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we called it a Cuvée. Um, but what I like to tell people is that, that, that Broken Rock produces a Merlot that Miles would drink. Yeah, that's right. He was having a Broken Rock cat, uh, Merlot as he was walking into that restaurant. He wouldn't say, I am not having any effing, you know, Merlot. It would be, I'm going to have that Broken Rock Merlot. And I'm going to have more of that effing Merlot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I think I, I, I actually got a, a text question here also, um, which is kind of attuned to this, which is, uh, and, and this is, let me just, Christian in Phoenix, um, is Merlot back or is this just wishful drinking? That's funny. Um, no, I think Merlot is absolutely coming back. Um, I, do, I do see other brands taking a stance and putting Merlot on there. We personally, for our foundry brand, we follow the same guidelines that, that the Prothrow Family Wines are doing, which is um, they call it a cuvee. We, we have a fanciful name for our Merlot-based wine on the foundry brand. So, you know, I, I, and, and, and for the exact same reason that we don't want to be caught up into that. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the Merlot, I mean, without hammering it home to you folks too much more, the Merlot from that property is, is very special. We also use it for all of our blending. And so, um, which I think we'll talk about a, a little bit later too. And, and, and now if it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and bring Sean Hilton into the conversation. And, and Sean, can you kind of tell us a little bit about your history with, with Broken Rock as a property? You, you've done cab from there, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my, uh, my wife, unfortunately, couldn't be here tonight, but she uh, led a project uh, back in um, the foundry days of Wine Foundry in 2010. And we did... Um, uh, we've got a 2010 Broken Rock Cab, if you can see it right here. Nice. It's what I'm drinking tonight. All right. Uh, it's called Psyched, and Stu with us uh, helped during our blending session name that wine. Uh, we were lucky enough to do 2014 Psyched, which is right here, and this is our baby. Um, it's due in two days, and right. that's our 2018 Broken Rock Cabernet. Um, so we were drawn to Broken Rock. Uh, and I think Bruce said things um, in a lot more eloquent manner um, compared to how I'd say them. I'm, I'm the, probably the only non-commercial uh, customer or partner on the panel tonight, but um, the power, the, the depth of, of that we heard about of, 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 you know, we thought of it as mountain fruit at the time back in 2000. 10 or 11 when we started with the, the 2010 vintage, um, we've never left it. Uh, we've made several cabs. We've done a few other cabs with Wine Foundry. And, and anyway, um, Broken Rock is, I, I'd say, is our favorite. It's what we talk about most with our friends, um, all of our friends who get to taste our wine uh, with us or if we give them as gifts, uh, absolutely love it. But um, uh, We've, we've really enjoyed them all, and I'm really looking forward to the 2018 as well. Um, 
Yeah, and I think uh, I don't know if we're going to talk about blends a little bit later, but we've 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 kind of had a pattern with ours, but they're predominantly, um, you know, at least at least ninety five percent, if not more, Cabernet from the Broken Rock Vineyard, and um, you know, there, there's some more stories to tell about that, but we're very very pleased with that, and and some of the things, all the things that Bruce said about the Merlot from there, I think. Um, uh, translate or, 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 or apply to the, to the Cabernet Sauvignon as well. Yeah. Uh, but the, the 2010 I'm drinking right here, uh, if you can, you know, it's, it's, it's ready to drink two years ago, I think. It's still great right now, um, but it's, it's, it's getting a little bit of maybe Texas Longhorn Auburnness, you know, or what's, what's the color of the, the Longhorns uniforms? Burnt uh, orange, and we don't like the long ones. <laughs> yeah. It's it's not it's not pure ruby or scarlet red anymore. You know, it's it's browning a little bit, and um, yes. that's a good thing when you have a good wine. Oftentimes, and and um, it's I'm enjoying it tonight. My wife's going to be upset, and we have to bring her half the bottle tomorrow when I see her. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's 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 aged very well, and um, uh, you know, it's um, it's still got a lot of a lot of oomph on the front and the mid palate. And, um, you know, we put Pradeep Verdot in there and it's, it's, it's not as, as kicking on the back end as, as I think that we probably intended it to be eight, 10 years ago or eight years ago when we blended. Uh, but it is, it's, it's superb. And I, it's hard to say if, if tens, 14s, or even what we blended, uh, uh, six weeks ago with our 18 upcoming bottling it is better. Yeah, I'm looking yeah. forward to the 18 because it's new. Yeah, well, you have some really interesting vintages there as far as, you know, you can really paint a picture between, you know, you have, you have 10 and then completely on the other side of the pendulum is 18 and 14 is closer to the 18, but 14 was a, a very high yielding year. 18 was as well, but um, 18, some crop loads were, were a bit different and actually out of Broken Rock, we actually had a, a relatively low yield out of 18, surprisingly. So, um, hmm. I, I think it'll be really interesting for you to kind of do uh, it won't quite be a vertical because you'll have some gaps in between there but you know an every four year vertical will be really cool to, to explore for you guys in a few months that's that's going to be quite cool because 10 was a cooler vintage um, and uh, and didn't quite uh, cooler milder temperatures um, 14 hot um, but uh, and, and pretty dry but 18, I'd say, is probably from a new world perspective going to end up showing is, is the best of those three vintages long term, I would, I would, I would say. Stu, you agree? Yeah, I, I, um, it's interesting. I feel like the tens was at the time was such a maligned vintage um, because it was such a cold thing. But it, it harkens back to what we were kind of talking about earlier when, when Rhonda and Bruce were talking is like kind of more old school where, and I was even talking to Sean about it uh, before, and he said at one point, I guess maybe 10 years ago, I had said, wow, the wine has a little jalapeno note on it. And I was like, well, that's the word of the day now. It's, it's pyrazines, which was closely, closely associated with, with 2010. But that's what is part of that, that grape and part of that vintage. Um, yeah. yeah. And did I really give you the name for the wine? What was that? You did, Stu. <laughs> you took you took a psyched. little swirl, a little sniff, a little taste. <laughs> you guys are psyched. <laughs> um, anyway, this 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 was the result my wife came up with. Yep. Um, yeah, it's a really pretty label. It's a great label, and I'm sorry that oh, uh, I did it backwards. <laughs> John, you should never listen to anything I say. So I, I apologize if you took something I said and used that for the label. Anybody who's on here. Never listen to Stu. <laughs> uh, we do have a question, though, um, that, that we'll, we'll kind of keep in mind as we bring in uh, Steve and Peter. So, uh, for the, uh, so this comes from Bruno, and Bruno is asking everybody, said uh, he's been working, he's been courting the wine foundry uh, for a few years now and finally signed up to make a uh, kind of a, a Saint-Emilion uh, uh, blend using Broken Rock Merlot is the base for, for is the foundation. Um, what advice do you have for somebody? First timer. First timer coming in using, uh, using Merlot and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll kind of, as the foundation, we'll kind of, we'll bring Bruce and Rhonda back into that since they're used to Merlot, but we should also hear from Steve and Peter 
and Sean because they use Merlot all the time in their blends. Fair enough? Well, we, I, I was starting actually to, to type you um, a response. So thanks oh. to, for, for announcing the question because my typing is really slow and bad. <laughs> one finger is great. Um, I, I think one of the beautiful things about Broken Rock um, is that it has such a strong sense of place and has such a strong sense of time uh, in the fruit that it gives you that it's easy to paint around the edges. It's easy to add some blush and some rouge and some lipstick to it. Um, you know, we, we work with George's Third, we work with Melrose um, uh, and work with Broken Rock and, and Broken Rock allows us to complement it with sometimes pretty liberal blending on our cuvee um, and, and we don't diminish that petulant broody character of it that we're looking for. Um, so, you know, I, I would say as, as we approach a Merlot from Broken Rock, we're, we, we're looking at adding some Cab Franc to build up that front. We're looking to add Petit Verdot to build up the back because we really value a Merlot that finishes more with, uh, with a presence in the back palette. Um, and then we're looking also at, you know, how do we add a little bit more weight to the, to, 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 to the mid palette, either with Cab or sometimes with, with Malbec or both. Um, so, but, but, but Merlot, allow, the, the Merlot from Broken Rock allows you to do that. Uh, you're not going to d diminish it. We're a little bit more judicial in how we approach our G3 because we don't, we, we find that, that we can greatly swing that sense of time and place in G3, much more so than we can in Broken Rock. Yeah, I, I think uh, my advice to Bruno, if I, if, if I can jump in here, is to um, try different avenues, you know? So when you, when you sit down to blend with Patrick, um, you're going to really be able to, your Merlot base wine is going to be great. And, and it's all about, tasting that base and then tasting the different components and finding the holes and finding finding where you want to go so obviously you're you're structuring towards the right bank uh style and so there's going to be some cab franc in there absolutely to flesh out the front um you're going to have some pv in there and then it's just you know how how fat and round is that middle for your palate and so i i'd say you know and Patrick's gonna gonna crush me for this. And I see I see that Frank is on here too, Patrick's godfather, who who is a big supporter of Patrick. Uh, so maybe he'll tell on tell on me to Patrick. But um, go feel free to get Patrick to do as many blends as you need there to go up to blend. You know, L, you know, J K L M, whatever. Just keep pushing it till you nail it down. When, when, see, see one, one thing I noticed that when we started off with, with the Merlot, uh, our intent was to make it as right bank as we could make it. Um, we found working with Broken Rock Merlot that the character of the Merlot itself was so pronounced and so good that we kind of backed off of, of being so right bankish. Yeah. And we just looked at, at how do we complement it. So it's kind of, it was an interesting journey for us. That's that, 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 there you go, Bruno, mic drop right there. I think that gives it to you. <laughs> so, so I'm going to shuffle down to my friend, Steve Dury down here from Stora Cellars and Steve's dialing in here from, from Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, and uh, Steve, we've talked about kind of our histories with the property. I know you had, you and Laura were in town uh, back when Monica worked with us mm -hmm. and Monica and Stu took you to Broken Rock for your first visit, is that right? Yeah, that actually was our, our very first vineyard visit. And uh, it's kind of an anecdotal story that we have that goes along with this. I know that, you know, Sean mentioned some, something about Stu having an influence on the name of your wine. Well, serendipitously, uh, we were, uh, driving in in his uh, in his car, heading up to the vineyard, and he looked at his clock and said, "Oh my goodness, it's eleven eleven And my wife Laura and I looked at each other like, "That's the name of our LLC, Eleven Eleven Cellars." <laughs> wow, this is pretty cool. And uh, and Stu's like, "What did I say?" <laughs> He's all innocent about it, and we're like, "Oh, this is definitely a sign. We can't wait to you know do more business with uh, with the wine foundry." But we went up to Broken Rock. And uh, we were actually going on, I guess it was kind of a special trip because we were gathering 
some of the berries to check the bricks. Um, and uh, there's a, a picture now being shown of Stu and my wife and, uh, and Monica there. But we had such a, a great time. It's a beautiful property, just uh, aesthetically gorgeous. And the views are amazing. But we actually, uh, when we finally circled back around and started using Broken Rock, the reason is, is we started with Valley for, Floor Fruits for our first couple vintages. And we didn't actually source from Broken Rock originally. Um, but we were finding that we wanted something with a little more structure, as, as Bruce had mentioned, that, that little bit of, uh, of you know, furrowed brow, if you will. Uh, I like that term. Uh, because we were really just working with that nice opulence of the valley floor. And it was kind of you know, very medium bodied wine. And we were looking for something with a little more kick. Something that uh, someone says, now that's a Napa cab. And uh, we didn't want the big, you know, Atlas Peak type cab. That wasn't what we're looking for. We were looking for a food friendly experience with our wines that's very palate friendly, that's not going to be full of tannins initially that you have to lay down for five years before you can enjoy it. We wanted something that pretty much after it's bottled that you could open it up and it would be very easy to drink, um, either for us or for our clients. And, uh, and Broken Rock, really uh, it nailed it. We, we entered our brand new bottle when it was just two months after bottling, really just after bottle shock. And we entered it into a competition and got a 91 point score and a gold medal. Um, very young wine. So it's already changed since that time last year. It's already getting more complex and it's really softening and the tannins are getting softer. Um, it's a lovely wine. We actually ended up with a 95% um, percent base wine on that. And then we just did a slight blend. I know we're going to be talking about blending and the, and the importance of that. Um, but really, when you, when you taste your base wine, you, you get the idea of the wine. And all you're really doing is you're just taking a little eraser, if you will, or a little magic marker, and you're filling in the gaps, whether you're looking for a palate experience or whether you're looking for complexity. Um, and uh, the Broken Rock is just a, a wonderful starting base wine for us, and we couldn't be happier. Nice. I love it. That, uh, that, that's very cool. That that's the start of your journey, and it's nice to uh, see the documentation of, of you and Laura in the vineyard, um, because really your, your brand is, is quite a, it, it's, it's really a love story at the end of the day. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's fun that, I don't know, it's really fun to see my colleagues out in the vineyard with you guys on that day. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Laura and I got married at 1111, which is why we call the company 1111 Sellers. Oh, there you uh, go. Nice. Yeah. And for Stu to say it's 1111 was just, you know, too much kismet going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, that don't listen to Stu. Don't listen to Stu. Peter Hartman. Hey, Stu. Uh, uh, yeah. Tell I mean, look, you've made wine, you've made more wines than anybody uh, in, in the foundry world. <laughs> uh, about 700 wines by, by this point. I mean, it, hundreds of wines, hundreds of wines. Peter, you've worked with the property for, for years. Look, you have, a different, you have a different approach with the wine. Tell us about your approach. Uh, yes, Stu. You know, I, in, uh, when you asked me to be on the, the uh, discussion today, I had to look back uh, to see exactly how we had used Broken Rock over the years. Um, we do not make a, uh, uh, a single vineyard designated Cabernet from Napa. We just make a regular, you know, Napa, it just says Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. And that's because uh, we, in, it, this it developed over a few years of tasting and talking with Stu and Patrick. Uh, we wanted to get, see if we could capture a range of flavors and complexity in one wine that would give us a broader perspective of the Napa Valley, rather than just one vineyard, whether that was up in the mountains or down on the valley floor. Um, so we, uh, Every year, uh, and I was, I had to go back and look at my, my records because I can't remember. Every year we make a, kind of a different cuvee, if you will, um, 
of from different from different Napa vineyards, usually two or three, uh, varied by uh, geography. Uh, we try to get we try to get a combination of valley floor and mountain fruit. And I have found, and I, 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 I've tasted these with their single venue designated uh, cousins, and I've tasted ours, and I can fully, I, I fully can taste the, uh, the, the different range. I can taste each individual wine in our, in our blend, but I can, and therefore I get the whole range. It, it's, it's quite a remarkable experience when I've been able to do that. Anyway, so... Steve, when he was making the introduction to Broken Rock, we've, oh, we've only made Cabernet. We've never made the Merlot from, from Broken Rock because we don't make a Merlot or Merlot-based wine. Uh, so we've used the Cabernet and uh, we settled on it uh, initially. I, I saw since 2007, we've used it in six vintages uh, in, with different, uh, with, with, combined with different vineyards. And uh, uh, the uh, what we found is that, as Steve said, we when he was giving the introduction, that given its location, it has, and I couldn't have said it better, Steve, the opulence and uh, lushness of the valley floor with the structure of the mountain fruit. Now it's kind of funny because in a way that's kind of what we're looking for. So we can just theoretically use a hundred percent. We could use 100% Broken Rock, and it would probably work. I never even thought of that before, to tell you the truth. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take that under consideration. But uh, uh, so what we've done, we've sort of looked at this as well, kind of an anchor for our blend, and we could go either way. We could use, consider it a mountain fruit and combine it with a valley floor fruit, or we could consider it more... Uh, more of the valley floor characteristics and take something from further up uh, as mountain fruit and see what comes out of it. Uh, so every year I'll sit down with, like I said, with Stu and Patrick, and we'll try to figure out uh, exactly which way we're going to go that year, what's available and what we liked before, uh, what we would like to improve on and or what we'd like to experiment with. And uh, we've got uh, a lot of, uh, I, I was really surprised at the range of vineyards and the range of, uh, of geographies that we have used with Broken Rock. Uh, right now, I am uh, drinking our 2013 Soma Cellars Cab, and it is, uh, it's combined with, <laughs> with Rutherford Bench Vineyard which is further down, and the ink grade vineyard, which we had a few, uh, you had for a couple of years, which is way up, and it's really intense mountain fruit. And uh, it's uh, just it, it, 2013, it's uh, six years old, six, seven years old, and it's drinking beautifully, and it's very harmonious and balanced. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very happy with this, without being overpowering. Very well, I was just, I mean, really, I mean, really well put. I mean, I, I, I hate to kind of classify it as a little bit country and a little bit rock and roll, you know, but, uh, um, yeah. and I also feel I am like also wary of like, uh, turning into a commercial for Broken Rock. Um, but, but I just really kind of want to, it, it, you guys have done a very good job of kind of pointing out what the vineyard does, you know, it, it, it has herbaceous flinty notes. Um, on, on that, on that are more closely associated with elevation, and then it also has fruit notes associated with the valley floor. Um, so it's kind of that tweener, and that's right. Going going back to that original question, you know, from somebody from Napa Valley, um, it's th that's that's the beauty of the benchlands, and also it's on the east side of the valley. So what does that mean? We know the sun rises in the east, but it's perched at the base of Atlas Peak. So when the sun is rising in the morning, the sun is not really hitting those vines because you have this, this large, the Vaca range is kind of blocking it. And then when, it, when the sun finally creeps over, then it gets there. 
where it really gets the ripening is starting at around 11 a.m., 12 a.m., and then the whole afternoon when the sun is in the west, setting, you know, heading towards sunset, it's really giving that ripening. So it's kind of a unique, uh, a unique characteristic. And Peter, you said you source from a vineyard called Rutherford Bench, which was on the other side of the valley, yeah. and then a vineyard which was way up on Howell Mountain. You have, you have all of these different things, and I think that's what makes your brand unique um yeah. well I, I, I mean it kind of that goes into the concept of blending right and so you it, it basically you've got your orchestra and everybody plays its part and you could also say that you know no small actors only small parts or what it, it's probably advice for no small parts only small actors i guess that's the more flattering way much more rigid school in my acting school <laughs> but, um, so for for blending you know Sean, you've been doing this for a while, and you, and you just blended. As you noted, that in a couple of days you're going to be bottling. You're bottling your your wine tomorrow or Friday or something. It sounds like, right? Um, yeah, I think uh, bottling scheduled for tomorrow. Okay, there we go. See, you know our bottling schedule better than me. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I asked, I asked, and I got an answer. Perfect, Adrian. Yeah, you know why? You know why I asked? Why? I want to know when I can pick it up. Is that <laughs> good answer? Yeah. So, so you just blended sometime in the last, like, probably six, eight weeks, I'd imagine. Uh, yeah, I think it was uh, third week of June. And there's a yeah. photo being shown of uh, our lab kit. Um, Patrick, our, our, our winemaker for our project, uh, helped because of COVID. Us, he helped us. Uh, he guided us through a remote blending. And he, um, he gave us some tips and hints. And... Um, with the help of the staff there, shipped us uh, four, four bottles of our, our base cab and uh, a bottle of Merlot from Broken Rock to Blend, a bottle of Malbec. Um, I think that was actually from near Sacramento. There, there they are, they're the blending wines. Yeah, the Malbec's up there. Um, a Cab Franc and, um, and uh, uh, Petit Verdot from Stagecoach. So, so you, you guys actually did the blending yourself. How many people are in your group? We have about 20. Oh, awesome. We're, yeah, we, we, we're just making a barrel right now. Wish it was two or three. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, oh, at the blending, cool. I think we had nine. So it was actually a very good number, a manageable number. Uh, we've, been, we've been through probably six, eight blendings before. Um, sometimes in a lab setting, sometimes uh, in a, you know, you're – um, uh, warehouse slash winery setting, you know, um, and, and, you know, other settings as well. And in this case, sometimes in little uh, sections of the office, and in this case, it was on our back patio in Roseville, California. And it, it worked out great thanks to Patrick's um, preparation and the staff's preparation and, uh, and our, um, uh, just the organization we had coming in as non-commercial winemakers. It was very, very helpful. So, we, we followed a kind of a script and, um, you know, just to take you through it very quickly, we, we started with uh, three wines. One was a hundred percent cab from Broken Rock. Uh, one was, uh, I think 96% cab from Broken Rock and 1% cab franc and 1% Merlot. And the third one was 96% cab saw from Broken Rock and, a one of Malbec and three of Petit Verdot. So we started there and then we, um, we were prepared to go as deep as we needed to go. We didn't get to L or, or M or N. Uh, we, would have been, we would have been calling the winery for more uh, blending wines, but <laughs> we got to six, six uh, iterations. And um, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of funny, you know, I always hear that from your staff and from Patrick and from Stu and, and uh, other winemakers, you know, long ago that we've worked with in your, your various teams. And um, the, the, the small changes, uh, we laymans even taste the difference of, you know. Yeah. So we, our, our, our final blend was, you know, half a percent of, uh, of, um, of Malbec and three and a half percent uh, Perdique for dough and one of Cab Franc and the Cab Franc was kind of me in the group saying I, I love the the characteristics that the Cab Franc brings to our overall project or overall finished wine so that didn't waver too much but the Merlot and the Malbec were kind of substitutes in our mind 
and uh, the Malbec won out um, just just by 0.5 percent. And I I joked with Stu this week uh, when I told him about our experience. I said I was the Patrick, so to speak, that day the chemist, and I had the the pipettes, and I pulled out the 0.5 percent for our 10 people, nine people to taste, and it was like spitting in a spittoon, barely. You know, it was. It was uh, just a tiny, tiny fraction in a graduated cylinder that was meaningless to the naked eye. Yeah. And yet everybody to a man of our nine people, we all agreed that that final, it was our fifth iteration was our final blend. Um, yeah. So it was, it was a fan, every, every blending experience I've had um, in our projects has been fantastic. And, and gosh, uh, I mean, we love being around you guys, but this one even on our own because of the preparation, that the wine you guys did and, um, I think Patrick was instrumental. Uh, it, it, it was, it was right up there. You know, I think I'm looking forward to the 2018, like I said earlier, um, as much as the 14 and 10. Let's not like get Patrick's it. head too big. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> he's not here though, is he? No, he's not. No, he's not. No, because he's blending. Yeah. Let, let's, uh, hey. Steve, Steve, can you like, can uh, you Stu, Stu? Not, oh, sorry, Peter. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just would like to make a comment following Sean's comments. I'm blending because I've got to drop off for another zoom meeting at seven o'clock. So. so in demand, Peter, we love yeah. you so much. Uh, thank you so much for but, joining us. Oh, but, but just let me say, I got to really kick out of Sean's comment mad about blending with nine people because I when I started making wine uh, at the wine foundry and crush pad before that I had a similar sort of group and we would get together and it was definitely the most fun part of the winemaking process for all of us uh, but we would go back and forth and back and forth and try to make should we do two percent of this three percent of that uh, we uh, we used uh, very small amounts, as you said. Uh, I'll sit down with Patrick, and we will uh, use uh, two or three percent Merlot and maybe one or two percent Cabernet Franc. It varies, of course, every year, and that is just to fill, as somebody said earlier, just to fill in the holes of the Cabernet itself. We don't want to uh, uh, override the Cabernet characteristics of it. Uh, and uh, so we use very small amounts and we'll identify, oh, it needs more in the mid palate. And Patrick and I will go back and forth between 2% or 3% of Merlot in order to fill that in. We'll go back and forth and back. We'll try for, oh, no, that's way too much because it's starting to compromise the, in, the integrity of the flavors of the Cabernet. Uh, and then we'll settle on one and we'll do, usually use a Cab Franc in the same way about to punch up the aromatics, something like that. It comes out as uh, beautifully, great mouthfeel, great flavors, great complexity. Um, uh, you know, it just, it really works well for us. And I'm sorry, uh, I have to go, but um, I'm glad you enjoy, you, call, you asked me to be on this to share some of my thoughts. I'm glad to do it. And uh, we're, I'm looking forward to making more gray wine out there. Come well, on. thank you, Peter. We're, we're, we're really excited that you're going to go on to do your more important Zoom right now. So, uh, so, so have a good time with that one. You're and a, Stu, nobody's more important than you. Remember the little people. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Bye. Bye, Peter. Bye, Peter. So, Bye. Steve, so Bye, Steve, Peter. Thank you. Yeah, Steve. So, Steve, you, Steve, you've heard different kind of I I interpretations. You heard how kind of Sean was playing with blending. You heard Peter chime in there. When you and Laura are kind of playing with it, what are you doing at the plate with, with blending? Because blending is such an important thing, you know? It really, it's actually probably more important than I probably ever realized before I became a winemaker. As a wine drinker, you know what you like and you know what you don't like. Um, luckily, Laura and I have a very similar palate. So we like similar wines. There are some things I like that she doesn't like, of course, but typically we're pretty much in alignment. She has a slightly different palate um, than me, but we're really darn close. But it really makes it kind of fun when we're in blending. I, I couldn't imagine doing it with nine different palettes, nine different tastes, or 20. <laughs> um, my goodness, you know, we have a hard enough time, just the two of us coming up with a decision um, through the different iterations. Um, but really, it, it, what we are striving for in the blending process is finding a wine that both 
Laura and I like to drink. And the reason is, if we don't sell it, we can drink it. So <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a win win. Um, but no, uh, really, we're looking for that the, a palate experience. So we taste that base wine and we are looking for the gaps. You know, we want to make sure that, you know, it feels smooth on the front and then it rolls right over the tongue and, and you can actually feel it on the back palate and smooth going down. I probably drink too much during blending because I'm not a spitter. Um, whereas Laura is really good about spitting it out and we're, we could be there for six hours. And by the time I'm done, I'm like, which one did we like, honey? No. <laughs> She'll have spitting to is your friend. Spitting is your friend. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes I'm like, I'm going to go back again tomorrow morning and try it again. And, uh, but the, the consultants at the wine foundry bring so much expertise to the table that you don't have to be that expert. You just have to know what you like. And when it comes together, it's like Nirvana. You know that that's exactly what you're looking for. It has the mouthfeel, the complexity, the taste, you know, if you're looking for that cot, you know, the cab frog uh, essence or the cab soft essence, you don't want to take away from that in the blending. You want to enhance it, um, but you want to soften it sometimes, or sometimes you want to, you want to bring some more tannic structure to it, depending on what you're starting off with. So we, we've been finding it's, it's, it's really the most enjoyable time that we have because we're spending a lot of time with people that we love at the foundry and, uh, and, and Laura and I get to, come up with a, a combination of decisions through little iterations, like everybody was saying, a half a percent or even a quarter percent we've done um, on some of the, the blends. We've, we've really taken it down just to polish off one little edge. And uh, it's a really fun experience. But the consultants, um, you know, like Patrick and, and others at the Foundry, they bring that experience. And we can pretty much share, this is what we are looking for. And they kind of give you a good starting point saying, okay, let's start off with Merlot and Cab Franc and, and Petit Verdot, and let's see if that's what you like. And if it's not, then we just do it over and over again until we're happy. And it, it's a really the best part of, of winemaking. Well, thank, it's a very kind thing to say. I really did tell you guys, no, this is not a commercial. I promise for everyone who's kind of tuning in. I think it's a hell of a commercial though. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, yeah, we couldn't do it alone. So, hey, so we need you. Hey, Bruce, when you were talking before about the cab, you were kind of talking about the role of blending. And, and, and so can you kind of, Rhonda, Bruce, you guys, you know, you, you, your blending session lasted a while. So what about the most recent one? Like, how do you, how do you play when you're looking at the wine? Well, it, it's interesting because um, we're not making a wine solely for our, our personal consumption or palate. We're making wine to sell. So therefore we recognize certain things. It has to be accessible out of the bottle. Uh, it has to have the traits that we're looking for in a wine as wine consumers. It has to have a front, it has to have a mid, it has to have weight, it has to have complexity, it has to have a finish. Um, and then we're also, we're also looking at it from a consumer's point of view because we've been in, in, in front of a lot of people. And if we say this has, you know, half a percent or a percent of Cal Franc in it, everyone goes, ooh, it has Cal Franc in it. And if we say, you know, it has Pradeep Verdot, people go, oh my gosh, it has Pradeep Verdot in it. That's really pretty cool. Um, there are certain, certain varietals that, that, that trigger people in a very positive way. Um, so we, we have an eye on that when we're blending because once again, we're blending for a commercial reason we, we sell out most of our vintages within you know the first 10 months of release um for us we value a um a, a style where the wine is expansive on the mid palate and then it carries that into the back palate and, and, and it meets with the oral fact you know you know oral factory elements of aromas and everything else um so, so blending becomes something where we're trying to structure the wine and craft the wine that way. Uh, and at the same time, we're trying to keep the accessibility of the wine. What we make and what we release um, based upon how we sell our wine does extraordinarily well. Is it a wine I would make purely for myself? No, I'd make some big, huge tannic monster with lower alcohol, <laughs> um, you know, you know, 13.5, 13.8, and, you know, 
I, I'd go that direction. Um, but we're not making it for us. We're making it for other people. So when we're blending, we, we take that into consideration. Getting back to Broken Rock, Broken Rock allows us to do that, do that more liberally than we can do with, let's say, Melrose or we can do with George's Third, because Broken Rock has such prominence, it, um, such depth of fruit and structure that it holds its own even as you're, you know, um, 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 attaching other things to it. Okay. Um, and so, and, and, and so that's why we like working with it. I would say going back to, to your question, uh, 2018 was a little different for us. You know, 2015, we actually added a little bit of Syrah, Petite, petite Syrah to it to add weight. Uh, you know, 2016 was a little bit different. 2017 was a little bit different. Um, we always hover around kind of the low 90s as far as the, the percentage of broken rock. Um, this year, we're, we're up above 95, 96, 97. And we found that a lot of it is what Steve was talking about, the characteristics of 18. 18, the, a lot of our conversations uh, um, during our barrel tastings and our blending process is, oh my gosh, this wine is just so good without blending. But then we, 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 we consider it for a wider audience and, and, and appeal and, and sticking to a house style um, that we have to, to represent vintage after vintage. Very well put. I, I, yeah, I, I think that's fantastic. I, I love that. And, um, you know, I think we've definitely all of us are giving Broken Rock a, a big virtual hug right now we, we, we enjoy it so much well well, well, well steve here, here's an interesting thing we've actually switched from broken rock for our 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 you know base cab right on your cab yeah we we've switched to merlot and and part yeah, of uh, to, to melrose to melrose yeah and part of that reason is something steve said we wanted to, to go back to something that was classically napa yeah um um, you know, something that you would pull a cork on and go, oh my gosh, that's a classic Napa Valley cap. Um, so we're using Melrose for this upcoming vintage as opposed to using Broken Rock. But, um, but, but it's, it's, it's not due to anything other than the fact that Broken Rock just takes a little time to come into its own. Yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a business decision at the end. Yeah, right. Yeah, it, 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 it's a wonderful wine, two, three, four, five years down the road. Out of the gate, uh, if you like bigger, structured, deeper cabs, cabs with a little bit of, 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 of flintiness and tar and leatheriness to them, it's, a, it, it's perfect. So as I... You know, we opened the 2017 tonight to try to see how it's progressing. Our cab. Our yeah. cab. As I taste this, I go, oh my gosh, did we make a mistake switching over to Melrose? <laughs> it's so friggin' good now that it's been in the bottle a year. What the hell did we do? Um, so, so we'll see. You know, it's, we'll see how that compares to, to um, you know, our past <laughs> vintage of Broken Rock. As Daniel Craig. Daniel Craig. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, I mean, I, I, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap this up in two seconds, I think, here. But that is the interesting bit of the business of wine that you, you know, the longer you hold something in bottle, in storage, you're paying for it, paying for it, paying for it. And so while you're waiting it to develop, you know, I, like right now, I'm drinking our Foundry 2013 Broken Rock, which literally I think is singing a song right now, but it's a 2013. <laughs> You know, yeah. so uh, so it, it takes a while. It takes a little bit to get there. Um, it's a fantastic, you know, like for for Sean, who's drinking his 2010. You know, like I, I don't even have any. My I, I think I literally have like two bottles of my 2010 because it's named after my daughter. So until she's maybe for her ninth birthday this December, I'll <laughs> but, you know, uh, I, I I I would love to be in a position where we could hold a wine like Broken Rock back for, you know, 12 to 24 months before we release it. But being self-funded, you're like, yeah. we have to sell it. I mean, Bruce and Rhonda, you, I mean, you, you guys are out, you guys are selling everything, you know, so you know, you barely even have enough to library for yourselves more than a couple of bottles. And so it's, it's definitely a, a challenge from the business of wine standpoint. And so, um, 
but but I, I'll, I'll just move to from the recording standpoint and I'm happy to stay on here and answer any questions and, and chat with our friends here but I would very much like to, to thank Sean and Bruce and Rhonda and Steve and and the artist formerly known as Peter Hartman uh, <laughs> who is no longer on the screen uh, thank you guys so much for for taking time out of your evenings to join us it really means a lot to us and I think um, for me personally it's really great to get all of your perspectives on Broken Rock from the Merlot and the Cabernet and the the role of blending both of those varieties into it. And it's it's quite a lot of fun. Um, and for everybody out there in Never Neverland, thanks for joining us. This is um, a lot of fun. We'll be back on, we're doing this now the second and fourth Wednesdays of every month. Um, so we'll be back August 12th, if my math is correct, that that is going to be the second Wednesday of August. Um, and uh, we're getting it, as Stu mentioned earlier, we're getting ready for harvest. So we will start getting a little further into the vineyard updates. Um, if you are a client or somebody looking at us, we also are going to be providing kind of a five or seven minute kind of intro into these videos to help update you on all of these things because it's a very efficient way to do it. And then you can drop off if you're not interested in the topic, but it's a good way to do it. And um, Stu's got his book club, which is, which is thriving. He's got authors banging down his door to get onto the book club. So Stu, what's your next book club and when is it? I apologize if you've been hearing the knocking uh, behind me because uh, the author- uh, oh, came, into the book club? Oh my God, it's, it's just beating down the doors. Um, yeah, nothing like, I loved when Forbes did a coverage of our book group. You have a dozen people talking about a book. Uh, that is, that is microeconomics. Um, but the author for this one signed up for the book group, uh, Jane Lopes. And uh, um, so vignette, and we're going to be doing it on August 19th, Wednesday night. Hey, if you like drinking wine, and sometimes we talk about the book as well, um, the book group is a good, a good way to kind of low-key and pretension free way uh, to explore wine in a new way. Uh, I would say, I, so this is the, this is now the fourth book, Stu, is that right? Uh, April, May, June, July, August, this will be number five. Okay, well I missed one in there, but um, I haven't read any of them personally, and I've been on three or four of that, I guess I've been on three of the four so far. And uh, it's actually just a lot of fun. So I, I, you know I, I just enjoy drink, it, and it's the most stress-free part of my day. I don't have to prepare, I don't have to talk, I just sit there and drink wine and occasionally- It's like a typical book club, you just drink the wine. That it's is perfect. the problem <laughs> with the United States right now, people. Uh, no, I'm joking. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna be a part of a book group and I'm not even gonna read the book. Uh, no, I'm, I'm gonna drink the wine. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording. So thanks for everybody, but we'll stay on and answer any questions and, and hang out. Thank you all so much. Cheers. 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 Cheers.